This review is for The World of Ice and Fire, The Untold History of Westeros and the Game of Thrones. This review will be completely spoiler free, so if you haven't read all the books, if you're not caught up on the show, even if you know nothing about this franchise, this is going to be a very safe, spoiler free review for you. But just quickly before we get into the review, I have to give a huge shout out and thanks to Sebastian, who has joined the channel's Patreon, and it's just so exciting because there are obviously a lot of improvements that can be made to the channel, and now we're starting to head towards achieving some of those goals on Patreon. The one I'm most looking forward to is being able to do regular art book giveaways for patrons, which I think will be very fun. So if you enjoy these videos and want to help improve the channel, then definitely consider joining the channel's champions, Matt and Sebastian, over on Patreon. And not only that, but Sebastian is also responsible for the channel's new profile picture and banner, which is such a huge improvement. So nothing but the sincerest thanks to you, sir. So the very first thing that has to be said about this book that you'll have already noticed is that it is an extremely beautiful beautiful book. It's got a large format and over 300 pages, so it's got a really hefty, impressive size to it, and all the graphic design elements throughout the book really come together to make this an extremely aesthetically pleasing book. And then there's the incredible art that's throughout the book. There are about 170 images, which is about one image per spread, which is pretty fair, and it's my understanding that all of the art in this book was specially commissioned for this book, which is really great to see. So even if you're the most long-running, hardcore fan of this franchise, there's going to be some really really great visuals for you in here. And at the back of the book, there's a list of all the artists who worked on the artwork, as well as crediting which pieces they worked on, which is really great to have included as well. And I just can't stress how great the fantasy art in this book is. And so the version of the book that we're looking at here is actually the UK edition. The only difference between this and the US version is the cover. However, I actually much prefer the US version. It doesn't have a dust jacket, but I think aesthetically it really looks like a book that you might actually find in the world. And why that's important, I'll explain a little later on. But also the actual construction, it feels a bit more sturdy than this UK version we're looking at here, which, has, which does have this nice paper dust jacket and then the silver foil stamping on the cover, but it just feels a little more fragile to me than the US version. So the book is written by George R. R. Martin, along with Elio Garcia and Linda Antonson. However, how much George R. R. Martin contributed to this book versus the other authors is sort of a huge point of debate and contention, and I can't really find any concrete answer. But the important thing is that George R. R. Martin does have some input into this book, and those other two authors who I do suspect were responsible for the majority of the book actually do have a pretty high recommendation going for them, that is, George R. R. Martin himself says that they know more about Westeros than he does and that he goes to them when he has questions about his own work for details he can't remember and stuff like that. So that means we're in pretty authoritative hands. However, the problem is that even though they may know a ton about Westeros, they are not very strong writers or specifically not strong storytellers. The style of writing in this book is significantly different from that found in the novels and not just because this is, you know, non-fiction and the main series is fantasy fiction. It's just that the writing in this book is, potent is, is quite boring in a lot of places. It reads very much like a high school history textbook. And the reason for that is, even though on the cover it lists these three authors, once you get past that cover, the book within is treated as a real in-world document that's been written by a maester of the Citadel. So this sort of scholarly approach to the material is actually appropriate from that perspective, I get that. But I believe that certain storytelling principles can be used to enhance any message in any medium in order to more effectively communicate information in a more engaging way. And when you're dealing with something like this amazing fantasy world, it's actually almost kind of unacceptable to not be able to achieve that. And actually, I think the best illustration of this point is within the book itself. So like I said, the majority of the book very much reads like an actual history. It's this group showed up here, built a castle here, this guy rallied some people and took it over, then this guy's son who had the same name came and took it from him, and then these people came and took it from him, and then a guy with... The exact same name again came and it's a lot of that it's sort of all these different names and characters and locations are going by so quickly and it's not that those stories are uninteresting in and of themselves quite the opposite i found myself several times each page there'd be something like a little bit mentioned about a certain character or some other potential side story and i found myself really wanting to hear more of that story i wanted that story expanded to learn about it but of course you can't do the entire history of a world in 300 pages and that sort of strain of trying to capture that really shows in this book it's trying to cover such a wide area that like i said things have to go by so quick and there's no and, and there's not a lot of opportunity to engage in stuff except for the section on the targaryen kings that makes up about a quarter of the book and that section to me really stood out as to what 
these sort of books should try and achieve. That is, the whole section on the Targaryen kings is at face value the exact same of the rest of the book in that it's about people and their children with the exact same names taking over castles and warring about stuff. But what made this section really engaging, and rather than making me sort of doze off, it actually kept me up turning the page at night, because those sections were sort of following the story of each king and the characters that surround them. So you're actually getting the history in the form of character development of a story. Each of the kings really felt unique in a great way, had a great story. And so then when you're being fed sort of more dry elements of history of of battles and buildings and different lands. You actually have a story and a context to place this information within and build a larger picture and deeper understanding of the world, its inhabitants, its cultures, stuff like that. I've been reading a lot of these lore books of late for different fantasy worlds and franchises, and this book here is certainly not the first to treat the book as an in-world document written by a character, which sounds at face value really cool and like it would be much more engaging and it does have the potential to be but in comparing all these different books and the way in which they communicate world building it actually seems to be a better more clear approach when it's written from sort of an omnipotent narrator's perspective because this book actually shows a lot of the limitations of using a character in the world for example the maester writing this book is actually kind of an unreliable narrator unreliable not in the sense that he's trying to deceive us but in that his knowledge of the world is limited in a realistic way the knowledge he's presenting is taken from other sources that he mentions throughout the book which sound really exciting it's just a shame they don't exist in our world but the problem is it sometimes becomes hard to rely on this book as a source for the canon of the series because the maester writing it contradicts things that we as readers know to be true and those contradictions arise because like I said the maester's knowledge is incomplete or he's dismissive of things we know to be true and actually that was the thing that probably out of everything was the thing I found the most disappointing with the book is that the maester has this very hard-nosed skeptical academic approach to the history of the world which in terms of a characterization is 100% entirely appropriate but the problem is that as someone who really loves fantasy and loves this fantasy world it's kind of disappointing to have this book by way of the book's narrator dismissing a lot of the myths and legends and fantastical elements of this world like there's this period of early history in westeros called the age of heroes which sounds amazing but then you have the narrator the maester dismissing a lot of those stuff saying this fantastic larger than life character was most likely made up by singers in fact it says so many times throughout the book it'll mention some sort of fantastical or legendary point and then say or so the singers tell us and i found that dismissiveness and skepticism of a lot of the world's fantasy elements to be kind of disappointing it made me wish that instead there was a book on the myths and legends of this world because that seemed to be where the excitement and sort of beating heart of this world was rather than just hearing about castles and conquests of land and things like that and i know i've dwelt on a lot of the negative aspects for this review but i really don't want to suggest that i think this is a bad book not at all i really enjoyed it I just mentioned these shortcomings for the fact that this is not the sort of book that I could give a blanket recommendation for. It's really the sort of book that I could imagine really big fans who will absolutely love this book and fans who will absolutely hate this book. And then people who are sort of more in between, like myself I guess, who can find a lot of joy and great information in reading this book, but it is a bit of a tough and sometimes boring read. Again, that doesn't mean that the book is bad, it just means you need to be the right sort of person or in the right sort of mindset to be able to really get a lot of enjoyment out of it, which is why I strongly suggest if you can get your hands on it just to even read a couple of pages to see if it clicks with you, it would be really beneficial. I know even on Amazon you can use the look inside feature for this book, which will be a really big help for you in deciding if the text in this book is the sort of thing you're really going to enjoy. And I'm not sure how many people this will apply to, but just in case, um, if you haven't watched the TV series or read any of the books, and you're thinking maybe this book might be a good way to introduce you to the world, no, no, no. You'll probably die of boredom and confusion. The book does require some sort of prior knowledge, at least into the sort of culture of this world. Which again makes sense from the perspective that the book is written but I just thought I'd mention that just in case. And also if anyone's wondering if there are any major revelations or secrets to be got from this book, um, there aren't. In fact I did the whole song and dance at the start about this being spoiler free but the fact is I don't even think there's anything in this book that could 
potentially spoil anything that happens in the actual series, uh, with one minor exception, but if you've been on the internet in the last three years, you probably already know that. Because the maester writing this book has produced this book during the same time as the novels are taking place, everything that is in the book actually only leads up to where the novels start, which I think is really cool because not only does that make sense, but it also means you're not necessarily getting a ton of repetitious material that you've already read. I think ultimately I really wish this had been planned as more of a series of books rather than just one book. Even looking at something like, say, Lord of the Rings, the history of Middle-earth isn't presented in one volume, it's presented in, I forget how many books are in the history of Middle-earth series, but like 10 or something, and then you've got all the other ancillary novels and Silmarillion, you know, so on, things like that. And so this book really does show the sort of limitations of trying to cram so much under one cover. But like I said, I really enjoyed it. This world that George R.R. R. Martin has created is just so fantastic. It's one of the most complicated, sophisticated, realistic fantasy worlds ever created. The level of detail and depth to this world that this book also really helps reinforce is incredible and sort of unlike anything I've ever seen, and sometimes even the level of reality they communicate actually has diminishing returns. You know, things like having five or six or seven kings with the exact same name. It makes for very confusing reading, but it really does help add this sense of verisimilitude to the world that, that for me anyway, is something that really stands out for this series, and I really do think this book helps enhance and expand the appreciation in painting new levels of detail for this amazing world of ice and fire.